November 19, 1863, 15,000 people gathered in an open field for the dedication of the National Cemetery at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. The principal speaker was Edward Everett, considered the nation's foremost orator. Everett gave the crowd what it expected and wanted to hear, including a vigorous denunciation of those responsible for the Civil War. After the singing of a hymn, President Abraham Lincoln arose to make a brief address. In his simple and elegant prose, one of the world's literary masterpieces, he lifted hearts and strengthened national will. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. We here must highly resolve that these honored dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Lincoln was born in a one-room log cabin near Hodgenville, Kentucky, on February 12, 1809. His parents, Nancy Hanks Lincoln and Thomas Lincoln, both born in Virginia, had been taken to Kentucky as young children and grew up illiterate or semi-literate. It is possible that both could read a little, but Nancy could not write her name, and Thomas could write his, according to his famous son, only bunglingly. The family, there was a daughter two years older than the future president, lived on two different farms near Hodgenville. In December 1816, Thomas Lincoln moved his family 90 miles northward across the Ohio River and settled near Little Pigeon Creek in the midst of the thick forests of southern Indiana. Though very young, Lincoln was large for his age and an ax was put into his hands immediately. From that time until he was 23 years old, he recalled, he was scarcely ever without one, except when he was plowing or harvesting. In 1818, during an epidemic of milk sickness, Nancy Hanks Lincoln died at the age of 35 and was buried in a rough wooden coffin. The year that followed was a wretched one for Thomas, his two young children, and one of Nancy's cousins, Dennis Hanks, who had come to live with the Lincolns in 1817. Finally, in December 1819, Thomas married a recently widowed friend, Sarah Bush Johnston, shown here in her old age. The new Mrs. Lincoln put clothes on Lincoln and his sister, so, as she put it, they looked more human, kept the whole household clean and well-fed, and proved a good and kind mother, as Lincoln later said. Lincoln worked hard on his father's Indiana farm, and while there, changed from a boy to a youth to an adult. Of his years in Indiana, Lincoln told a friend, there was absolutely nothing to excite ambition for education. Yet something or someone had excited it in Lincoln. Perhaps it was the schoolmaster who had lived across the road from one of the Kentucky farms. Perhaps his ambition was excited by the Blab or ABC schools Lincoln and Sarah attended in Indiana for about four months in 1822 and about six in 1824. His stepmother, illiterate herself, recalled that Lincoln was diligent for knowledge and read all the books he could lay his hands on. He read the Bible some, she continued, though not as much as is said. He sought more congenial books suitable for his age. On the Indiana farm, Lincoln grew to be six foot four inches tall, and in his early 20s, probably weighed well over 200 pounds. Because of his great size and strength, he was in much demand as a laborer in the growing settlements along Little Pigeon Creek. Accordingly, his father occasionally hired him out to split rails for fences, plow fields, butcher pigs, and perform other farming chores. One such experience not involving farm work must certainly have excited his ambition. A neighbor hired Lincoln to operate a ferry across the Anderson River 
where it flowed into the Ohio near the town of Troy. Even more stimulating in his awakening to the world beyond his father's farm were flatboat trips he took down the Ohio and Mississippi rivers to New Orleans in 1828 and 1831. After selling their produce, Lincoln and his companions went sightseeing. The effect on Lincoln's mind of seeing so many vessels from ports all over the world tied up at the wharves, their masts and stacks forming a forest very different from any the young man had seen before. Of the scores of steamships coming down river and preparing to go back up. Of the startling excitements and temptations of the renowned French Quarter. Of the experience of personally observing the slave marts, where men, women, and children were merchandised like cattle, must be left to the imagination, for Lincoln wrote and said a little about it. Yet the effect must have been a profound one, and may have been a factor in the estrangement with his father that came soon after his return to Indiana from his first trip. Whatever caused the rupture between father and son, it was extreme and permanent. They seldom saw each other after the early 1830s, even though Thomas and his wife settled on land near Charleston, Illinois. As soon as he was free of obligations to his father, Lincoln headed off on his own, determined to make something of himself. He did not know what it would be, only that it would not involve full-time farming. Lincoln was hired by one Denton Offutt to make his second flatboat trip to New Orleans. They had only gone a few miles down the Sangamon River in the spring of 1831 when they became stuck on a mill dam beneath the village of New Salem. Lincoln's size, strength, good nature, and skill in freeing the boat made a favorable impression on the residents. Lincoln and Offutt were themselves impressed with New Salem and after the successful completion of their trip, Offutt opened a store in the village and hired Lincoln as a clerk. His job in Offutt's store gave Lincoln his first opportunity to engage in community life and, under the tutelage of the schoolmaster, Mentor Graham, to study English grammar and mathematics. Lincoln soon became a local favorite. His popularity was such that Jack Armstrong, leader of a rowdy group known as Clary's Grove Boys, challenged him to a wrestling match. All the different versions of the fight agree that it ended amicably and with lasting mutual respect. Offutt closed his store and Lincoln volunteered to serve in the war against the Sac and Fox Indians. Enlisting in a militia company, he was quickly elected captain, thanks in part to the backing of the Clary's Grove Boys. When he returned from the Black Hawk War, Lincoln and one William F. Berry borrowed money to open a store in New Salem. Unfortunately, Barry proved to be unreliable and a heavy drinker, and the store went deeper and deeper into debt. Finally, as Lincoln wrote, it winked out. Barry died in 1835, leaving Lincoln with responsibility for $1,100 in debts, a huge amount. In order to support himself and start retiring what he called his national debt, which he succeeded in doing in the 1840s, Lincoln acquired a compass and chain, read the appropriate how-to books, and became the county's deputy surveyor. In addition, he split rails, hired himself out to farmers, and took jobs as a handyman. Somehow, he also received an appointment as postmaster for New Salem. The office paid little, but gave Lincoln the opportunity to read all the newspapers subscribed to. Politically, Lincoln was a Whig who favored government subsidies for railroads, improvements of river navigation, and education to improve the lives of people. In 1834, he was elected to the state legislature, which met in Vandalia, and was re-elected in 1836, 1838, and 1840. By the time of his fourth term, a sturdy capital had been built to replace the rather crude quarters the legislature had been using. But it was not enough to keep the capital from following the northward movement of population to Springfield in 1839. While serving in Vandalia, Lincoln roomed with another legislator, John T. Stewart, who encouraged him to study law and lent him the necessary books. Lincoln had ample time to study in New Salem and in 1836 was licensed to practice law. In other ways too, New Salem contributed to Lincoln's intellectual growth. One resident, Jack Kelso, inspired him with readings and recitations from Shakespeare and Robert Burns and he came into contact with many travelers who stopped at the inn kept by James Rutledge. At the Rutledge Tavern, Lincoln met and fell in love with Anne Rutledge, the innkeeper's slender and beautiful 19-year-old daughter. However, she was betrothed to another man, 
and Lincoln could not declare himself. But this man suddenly left for New York to provide for his aging parents. As the months passed, Anne and the townspeople became convinced he had no intention of returning and marrying her. By this time, the Rutledges had moved to a nearby farm, and Lincoln visited Anne there as often as he could. It is likely the two lovers talked of a future together. Then Anne contracted a fever and died in 1835. Lincoln took her death very hard, so hard that some of his friends feared he might take his own life. The story of Lincoln's love for Anne Rutledge is based entirely upon reminiscences, and some eminent historians have in the past dismissed it as a myth, a legend. But all of what is known about Lincoln's life in New Salem is based upon reminiscences, and, as recent scholars have pointed out, there's no more reason to doubt Lincoln's romance with Anne Rutledge than there is to doubt his fight with Jack Armstrong. When the state capital moved to Springfield in 1839, the town's population was only 1,500, but it was the center of a booming agricultural county of nearly 20,000 people. It had churches, schools, stores, taverns, doctors, lawyers, and a courthouse in which state business was at first transacted. The Greek Revival capital, built in the town square, was not completed until 1853, though some parts of it were in use before then. Springfield was an improvement over Vandalia, but most Easterners would have considered Lincoln's eight-year experience in the Illinois legislature to be more nearly comparable to service in their county rather than their state governments. When Lincoln rode into Springfield in March 1837 on a borrowed horse, he carried a few dollars in cash and all of his possessions, two or three law books and some clothing, in his two saddlebags. A storekeeper, Joshua Speed, offered to share his room above the store with Lincoln, who gratefully accepted. For the next four years, the two young men, both in their 20s, continued to room together and became close friends. They confided in each other, especially about their relations with women. In 1833, when he was still living in New Salem, Lincoln had met one Mary S. Owens of Kentucky, who was paying a brief visit to her sister and was much attracted to her. When she returned three years later, Lincoln found, somewhat to his own surprise, that he was engaged to marry her. He also found that he no longer had romantic feelings for her. When, as a matter of honor, he asked her to marry him, she declined. Lincoln was both relieved and humiliated. The affair ended happily for Mary Owens, too. Lincoln, she later recalled, was deficient in the little links that make for woman's happiness. In Springfield, Lincoln practiced law with three different partners. The first was John T. Stewart, who had urged him to study law. And the second was Stephen T. Logan, one of the most respected members of the county bar, who stressed upon Lincoln the necessity of thorough preparation in his cases. Finally, in 1844, Lincoln started his own firm with William H. Herndon, nine years his junior. Herndon managed the office, kept the books, and did much of the legal research. Although he and Lincoln were unlike in many ways, they got along well and their firm prospered. On the day before he left Springfield to become president, Lincoln paid his last visit to their third-story office on Fifth Street near the Capitol. As he descended the stairs, Lincoln pointed to the Lincoln and Herndon sign swinging on its rusty hinges at the bottom. Let it hang there undisturbed, he said to Herndon. If he lived, he would come back and they would go right on practicing law as if nothing had ever happened. The city of Springfield grew rapidly once it became the state capital. Buildings filled up the lots on the streets facing the square where the state house was being built and on both sides of the streets approaching the square. Offices, hotels, and taverns grew as if by magic, and further out came comfortable houses and some residences almost large and elegant enough to be called mansions. In the 1840s and 50s, Springfield was the social capital of Illinois, as well as its political capital. Although Lincoln neither felt nor looked as if he belonged in Springfield's highest social circles, that is nevertheless where he found himself soon after his arrival. One of the most prominent leaders of Springfield society was Ninian W. Edwards, who was married to Elizabeth Todd, a member of one of the leading families of Lexington, Kentucky. 
In 1839, Elizabeth's younger sister, Mary, came to Springfield to live in the Edwards home, and in due course became acquainted with Lincoln, Stephen A. Douglas, and other eligible bachelors. Lincoln was uncomfortable around women, not good at drawing room small talk, and unable to converse with the well-educated Mary about many of the subjects of interest to her. They were an oddly matched pair, Lincoln so tall and Mary only five foot two inches in height and plump in figure. But she recognized in Lincoln a quality and potential most others could not see. And he was attracted to her intelligence, warmth, and vivacity. Both were keenly interested in politics and avid readers of the newspapers. Sometime in 1840, they agreed to be married, though no formal announcement was made, and Lincoln gave her no ring. For reasons not definitely known, but much speculated about, Lincoln broke off the engagement at the end of the year. It appears, as Lincoln's confidant, Joshua Speed, later wrote, that Lincoln was not entirely satisfied that his heart was going with his head. If so, Lincoln paid a high price for his romantic impulsiveness, experiencing, as he had after the death of Ann Rutledge, a prolonged period of extreme despondency. However, he and Mary were finally married in November 1842 in the Edwards home. The story that Lincoln broke his engagement and publicly humiliated Mary by simply failing to appear at their scheduled wedding ceremony is untrue. The Lincolns moved into the Globe Tavern, a simple two-story wooden building where they obtained board and room for $4 a week. It was a major step down for Mary, who was used to living in luxury, but she loved Lincoln and had confidence in his future. Two years after the birth of their first son, Robert Todd Lincoln, in August 1843, the couple moved into a five-room house of their own on the northeast corner of 8th and Jackson, for which Lincoln had paid $1,200 in cash at a city lot. The house, shown here after remodeling, the first and only one Lincoln ever owned, was located at the edge of town, but it was an easy six-block walk to the capital. Here their second son was born in March 1846 and named Edward Baker Lincoln after one of Lincoln's good political friends. Springfield was the headquarters of Illinois' 8th Judicial District. For three months every spring and three every fall, the presiding judge, accompanied by a retinue of attorneys, would make the circuit of county seats to try whatever cases had arisen since their last visit. Traveling the circuit not only gave Lincoln the extra money to purchase his house, it provided the public exposure he needed as an ambitious Whig politician. Lincoln was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives in 1846 and served a single term. He found much of the work routine and uninteresting, and he missed Mary and the boys, who spent most of the time with her father in Lexington, Kentucky. He was disappointed, too, not to receive the patronage position he wanted from the Whig president, Zachary Taylor, elected in 1848. Lincoln returned to Springfield a private citizen, preoccupied with his law practice and his family. Eddie, age four, died in February 1850. Willie and Tad were born in December 1850 and April 1853. Lincoln seemed destined to become the wealthy senior partner of a successful law firm. Then, in 1854, his destiny changed, and so did that of all Americans. In an autobiographical sketch written for use in the 1860 presidential campaign, Lincoln said of himself, in 1854, his profession had almost superseded the thought of politics in his mind when the repeal of the Missouri Compromise aroused him as he had never been before. What aroused Lincoln and many thousands of other Northerners was the passage by Congress in 1854 of the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which opened Western territories to slavery from which the institution had been excluded since the Missouri Compromise of 1820. The author of the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which changed United States policy on slavery, was Lincoln and his wife's friend, Democratic Senator Stephen A. Douglas. He hated opening the Western territories to slavery, Lincoln said in his first published speech, attacking slavery on October 16, 1854. I hate it because of the monstrous injustice of slavery itself, and because it deprives our Republican example of its just influence in the world. 
Although the Constitution recognized or protected slavery in the states, Lincoln declared emphatically that nothing in the Constitution recognized or protected it in the territories. I wish to make and to keep the distinction between the existing institution and the extension of it so broad and so clear that no honest man can misunderstand me. Public indignation against the Kansas-Nebraska Act among those Northerners who opposed slavery, not all Northerners did by any means, was so strong that a new political party, the Republican Party, was founded by anti-slavery Whigs and Democrats. Lincoln soon became its leader in Illinois. In 1858, the Illinois Republicans nominated him to run for the U.S. Senate against Senator Douglas, who was seeking another term. The main feature of the campaign was a series of debates the two candidates engaged in before crowds of thousands in seven different Illinois towns. Douglas won re-election, but Lincoln became a national figure. Naturally, there was talk about him as a possible presidential nominee in 1860. When the Republican National Convention met in Chicago in June 1860, Illinois Republicans were enthusiastic for their rail splitter candidate but most did not really believe he could win the nomination away from United States Senator William H. Seward of New York. However, Seward had made political enemies in his long career and might not run well in some key states. Lincoln, on the other hand, was a supremely available candidate and beat Seward for the nomination on the third ballot. Hannibal Hamlin of Maine, a former Democrat, was nominated for vice president to balance the ticket. Although Lincoln received only 39.8% of the popular vote, he received a substantial majority in the Electoral College. In reaction, seven states of the Deep South formally seceded from the United States, adopted a constitution for a new nation, the Confederate States of America, and elected as provisional president and vice president two formidable Southern moderates, Jefferson Davis of Mississippi and Alexander H. Stevens of Georgia. Confederates believed that the program Lincoln and the Republicans were pledged to enact, the prohibition of slavery in the Western territories, was a denial of their equal rights under the Constitution. In seceding from the United States and establishing a new government, they were simply exercising one of the inalienable principles of the Declaration of Independence. Lincoln and the Republicans denied that their program was an abuse of power. Slavery had been forbidden in the territories several times in the past and said that Southern resistance to an act of Congress would be rebellion. Lincoln was largely unknown outside his own state, and the people of other states wondered about his character and capability. Since he had had so little opportunity to demonstrate his abilities of leadership, most of the newspaper reports focused on his appearance for clues to his character. Many of them were not at all flattering. He was now thin as well as tall, his weight dropping to 180 pounds, and though he retained much of the strength of his youth, his spareness and stooped posture gave him the look of a consumptive. But it was his face more than his cadaverous figure that most often caused adverse reactions. Lincoln's face is such a familiar part of our lives, it is difficult to realize that in his time, his long, scrawny neck, his deep facial lines, his sunken cheeks, his large nose and enormous ears, his dark and often unkempt hair, made him the object of ridicule. To many of his contemporaries, he looked like a yokel, a hayseed, a country bumpkin. By the time of his election, the west of Lincoln's boyhood and youth had become a booming agricultural region its prosperous cities and towns linked by railroads and boasting an abundance of churches, schools, and business for lawyers. Lincoln himself had experienced a material and intellectual development along with the West, but it did not register on him personally. His appearance recalled the Old West, not the New, the wilderness West of dense forests, log cabins, and travel by ox cart. Wherever he went, Lincoln carried the frontier with him, Although Lincoln always regretted his lack of education, he was probably not self-conscious about how he looked until the middle 1850s, when his practice as a lawyer brought him into contact with big city clients and attorneys who had had more formal training and more conventional looks.
Within days after being elected president, he began to grow a beard. Facial hair was coming into style, but as president, he helped to set the style. His predecessor in the White House was clean-shaven, as was his successor, and so were many other political leaders of the Civil War. Most likely, Lincoln felt that a beard would fill in the hollows and soften the lines of his face, making him look more dignified, more presidential. In Springfield at 8 o'clock in the morning on February 11, 1861, the president-elect stood on the rear platform of the railroad car that would take him to his inauguration. The conductor was about to signal the engineer to get underway when Lincoln began to speak to the thousand friends and neighbors who had gathered outside the Great Western Depot to say goodbye. My friends, Lincoln began his extemporaneous remarks, no one, not in my situation, can appreciate my feelings of sadness at this parting. To this place and the kindness of these people, I owe everything. Here I have lived a quarter of a century. Here my children have been born and one is buried. I now leave, not knowing when or whether ever I may return, with the task before me greater than that which rested upon Washington. The conductor lifted his hand towards the court and Lincoln ended his little speech. I bid you an affectionate farewell. The conductor pulled the cord, and slowly the train chugged away from the station, the people waving and calling their own affectionate farewells. It is safe to say that no president-elect leaving his hometown to become president of the United States was ever in so somber a mood. If his remarks were melancholy, even depressed, there was a good reason for it, and the townspeople understood. Most of them may also have understood why he was uncertain he would ever see them again. Northern voters, at least the readers among them, were well acquainted with Lincoln's views on the divisive issue of the time, the expansion of slavery. But they were not acquainted with Lincoln himself. Few believed that the uneducated and inexperienced president-elect was capable of providing the country the leadership that it needed. To introduce him to the people and bolster their confidence, the train took a circuitous route in 12 days to reach Washington. At small towns along the way, the train stopped and he appeared and spoke briefly to unexpectedly enthusiastic crowds. At major cities, Lincoln spoke at greater length. If states could secede at will, he told one crowd, then the union would not be anything like a regular marriage at all, but only a sort of free love arrangement. At Independence Hall in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, where the Declaration of Independence had been adopted, he spoke about the meaning of the American Revolution. The Declaration had given promise that, in due time, the weights should be lifted from the shoulders of all men, and that all should have an equal chance. If the country could not be saved without giving up that principle, he declared, I would rather be assassinated on the spot than surrender it. The night before speaking at Independence Hall, Lincoln learned from two separate and reliable sources of a conspiracy to assassinate him as he passed through the ardently pro-secessionist city of Baltimore, Maryland. At the insistence of General Winfield Scott, ranking officer in the U.S. Army, and Senator Seward, soon to become Secretary of State, he quietly changed his plans, passed through Baltimore in the middle of the night on a special train, and arrived safely at his suite in Willard's Hotel, Washington, early in the morning of February 23rd. His wife Mary and their three sons joined him later in the day. The trip was over, but Lincoln's secret arrival in Washington was ridiculed in the Democratic press. There had been no Baltimore plot against him, the opposition insisted, and columnists and cartoonists competed with each other in portraying the president-elect as a coward. According to his friend and self-appointed bodyguard, Ward Hill Lamon, Lincoln always regretted having sneaked into the Capitol, and thereafter refused to be intimidated by the continuing threats against his life. On March 4th, Lincoln and the retiring President James Buchanan rode up Pennsylvania Avenue to the Capitol in an open carriage. Armed soldiers, together with especially recruited volunteers, lined both sides of the street. Sharpshooters were placed on rooftops to watch the windows opposite them. 
and artillery was moved into places where the crowd was thickest at the capital's east front. At about one o'clock on a bright and clear afternoon, Lincoln stood before a small table on the portico and read his inaugural address. In this conciliatory speech, Lincoln reassured the southern states that he had no authority and no inclination to interfere with slavery within their limits. The central idea of secession was anarchy, he said. In your hands, my dissatisfied fellow countrymen, and not in mine, is the momentous issue of civil war. The government will not assail you. You can have no conflict without being yourselves the aggressors. You have no oath registered in heaven to destroy the government. While I shall have the most solemn one to preserve, protect, and defend it. The Civil War began five weeks later, early on the morning of April 12, 1861, when Confederate batteries in Charleston, South Carolina, opened fire on Fort Sumter, which dominated Charleston Harbor. The fort surrendered formally on April 14. Lincoln's response was prompt. The next day, he issued a proclamation calling 75,000 men to arms to suppress the rebellion. At the end of the month, Jefferson Davis sent a message to the Confederate Congress in Montgomery, Alabama, referring to Lincoln's proclamation as a declaration of war against this Confederacy. That's what it was, all right. Now the question became, how would the country, North and South, respond? It did not take long to find out. Virginia seceded on April 17th, except for its western counties, which refused to go along and soon became the state of West Virginia. Arkansas, Tennessee, and North Carolina followed Virginia into the Confederacy. In the slave states of Maryland, Kentucky, and Missouri, timely and aggressive action by Lincoln prevented secession, but most of their people remained sympathetic to the South and hostile to Lincoln and his war. In the North, the firing on Fort Sumter had a Pearl Harbor impact on public opinion, uniting it, if only briefly, behind the Lincoln administration. The Confederates had fired on the flag. That made them rebels and traitors. The South went to war in 1861 with enthusiasm and confidence. It had very good reasons to think it would win. Otherwise, Southern leaders would never have led it into war. The South did not have to conquer the North. All it had to do was keep on fighting until the heavy casualties suffered by the offensive side would sicken the people of the North and force the government to make a peace recognizing the independence of the Confederacy. Could the Union be preserved by force? President Buchanan had stated in his 1860 message, the fact is our Union rests upon public opinion and can never be cemented by the blood of its citizens. If it cannot live in the affections of the people, it must die. A union in which states were held together by military force would be a despotism. So Lincoln, determined to use all the force necessary to preserve the union, was gambling for fabulously high stakes and with the odds against him. The real issue of the war, as Lincoln saw it, involved much more than the preservation of the American Union. It involved the survival of the idea that the people were capable of governing themselves that a constitutionally elected government could overcome the resistance of a dissatisfied minority. If it could not, monarchy or some kind of dictatorship might be the only alternative to anarchy. If Lincoln believed on April 15th that 75,000 men would be enough to break up the disloyal combinations in the South and repossess the forts and other United States property Confederates had seized, he learned better very quickly. By July 1st, nearly 187,000 men were under arms. In mid-July, General Erwin McDowell, the first of a series of unsuccessful Union generals, led 35,000 recruits on a campaign to end the rebellion by capturing the Confederacy's new capital of Richmond, Virginia, 100 miles away. The public was confident of success, and confident that success would end the rebellion.
but on July 21st, only 20 miles from Washington, at the Battle of Bull Run, Virginia, or as the Southerners called it, Manassas, the Union Army was repulsed by Confederate forces, and its untrained volunteers fled in panic back to Washington. It was a humiliating defeat, but it taught Unionists that they faced a real war, not just a police action, and that they would have to mobilize their men and resources on a scale not before imagined. Congress promptly authorized the enlistment of a million volunteers to serve for three years. By war's end, some two million men had served the Union, about three quarters of a million the Confederacy. A few days after the defeat at Bull Run, the field command of all U.S. troops was given to 35-year-old George B. McClellan. A superior army administrator and drill master, McClellan soon turned his men into a well-disciplined and well-equipped army, the Army of the Potomac. But months passed and he did nothing with it, in part because he was troubled by self-doubt. He was contemptuous of Lincoln, whom he considered his social and intellectual inferior and was rude to him on several occasions. Lincoln said that he would hold McClellan's horse if only he would bring success. But the major campaign McClellan finally undertook against Richmond ended in failure in July 1862, after three months of futile bloodshed. McClellan, a Democrat, blamed his failure on his Republican enemies in Congress, upon Secretary of War Edwin M. Stanton, and upon his Commander-in-Chief. At his supply base in Virginia on July 8th, McClellan handed Lincoln a letter warning him against interference with the property of Southerners, especially slave property. Because it was obvious McClellan was preparing himself for leadership in the Democratic Party, Lincoln said nothing. General John Pope was next given the principal command of U.S. forces in the Eastern Theater of Operations. Upon assuming command, Pope issued orders making it clear, with Lincoln's obvious approval, that, unlike McClellan, he would be no scrupulous observer of the property of disloyal civilians. But in August, he was defeated at Second Bull Run and had no further opportunity to practice his new kind of war. Against the advice of most of his cabinet, Lincoln now restored McClellan to the chief command in the East. The appointment appeased Northern Democrats, but it angered many Republicans against Lincoln. At Antietam, Maryland, on September 17th, McClellan stopped Confederate General Robert E. Lee who was undertaking his first invasion of the North. The victory in this bloodiest single day in the Civil War, indeed in American military history, gave Lincoln the opportunity to issue a proclamation he had been holding impatiently for several weeks. Though Lee withdrew from the Antietam battlefield, he did not retreat back into Virginia, and Lincoln urged McClellan not to let him do so. If we cannot beat the enemy where he now is, the president wrote, we never can. Early in October, he paid a visit to the headquarters of the Army of the Potomac, but nothing he said could induce McClellan to move. Lee crossed the river, and when McClellan finally followed him, it was too late. Next in the unhappy sequence of Union commanders of the Army of the Potomac was Ambrose Burnside, who did not want the command and said he was unfit for it. The Battle of Fredericksburg in December 1862 proved that he was right. Lincoln, the Army, and the Unionists of the North were in despair. After Burnside, Joseph Hooker, Fighting Joe, was given command of the Army of the Potomac, only to be defeated at Chancellorsville in May. The public was appalled. The administration was spending the blood and lives of its soldiers on a frightful scale and accomplishing nothing. When Lincoln learned that Hooker had been defeated, he burst out to a visitor in the White House, if hell is worse than this place has been for the last year, I can't help sympathizing with the devil. At the end of June 1863, Hooker yielded command to General George Meade, the fifth commander of the Army of the Potomac in 10 months. Meade was a competent general and stopped Lee's second invasion of the North in three days of fierce fighting at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. Casualties on both sides were frightful, but at least the Union had scored a victory. 
in an order congratulating his troops, Meade declared that he looked to the army for greater efforts to drive from our soil every vestige of the presence of the invader. When Lincoln read this order, he cried out in anguish, drive the invaders from our soil? My God, is that all? Turning to John Hay, one of his private secretaries, he said, this is a dreadful reminiscence of McClellan. Will our generals never get that idea out of their heads? The whole country is our soil. Like McClellan after Antietam, Meade allowed Lee's defeated army to get away. We had them within our grasp, Lincoln exclaimed. We had only to stretch forth our hands and they were ours. And nothing I could say or do could make the army move. If I had gone up there, I could have whipped them myself. What does it mean, Mr. Wells? He asked Secretary of the Navy, Gideon Wells. Great God, what does it mean? It meant that after seven major battles and almost as many defeats, Lincoln had still not found a commander for the Eastern Theater who understood that Union victory required the destruction of the South's armies, not simply their defeat, and the crushing of Southern ability and will to raise new armies. In the Western Theater, there was a man who did understand, Ulysses S. Grant. Like most others in April 1861, Grant had assumed that the war against the South would be a limited one that as soon as the Union won a major battle, the Confederacy would collapse. In February 1862, while McClellan was still only drilling the Army of the Potomac, Grant did win a major battle, capturing Forts Donelson and Henry in Tennessee and taking 22,000 prisoners. But the Confederacy did not collapse. Instead, in April, it counterattacked in force and almost defeated Grant at Shiloh in southern Tennessee. After Shiloh, Grant later wrote, I gave up all idea of saving the Union, except by complete conquest of the South. Recognizing that the South could not be defeated in a limited war, Grant now adopted a new policy. He treated all civilian property that could be used to supply or sustain a Southern army exactly as if it were conventional contraband of war, like arms and munitions. Lincoln, too, recognized the necessity of expanding the war and on January 1st, 1863, went beyond anything he had authorized Pope and Grant to do in confiscating the property of Southerners. Later in the year, Grant moved his army down the Mississippi to the Confederate fortress at Vicksburg, and after a brilliantly conducted siege, captured the city on July 4th, the same day as Lee's retreat from Gettysburg. In March, 1864, Lincoln brought Grant to Washington, gave him command of all the U.S. armies, and told him to go out and win the war. The particulars of your plans, he told Grant, I neither know or seek to know. At last, Lincoln had found a general who knew what had to be done to win the war, and whom he could trust to go out and do it. Very few families had lived in the White House before the Lincolns moved in with their three sons in March 1861. Robert, now 17 and a student at Harvard, was away most of the time. But for Willie, age 10, and Tad, 7, the old house was the site of endless adventures. They explored every room from the basement to the roof and enjoyed dashing noisily about on the first floor, which during the day was crowded with military and civilian officials and visitors of all kinds. Tad was known to have pulled a few unsuspecting beards. The boys had ponies of their own in the stables and their two goats were said to have been escorted at least once to the second floor living quarters. Lincoln spent much less time with Mary and his sons than he had in Springfield. Always a light sleeper, military and political problems often kept him awake far into the night, and he was usually in his second floor office by 7 a.m. Believing that the leader of a republic should be accessible to the people, he set aside two or three hours most weekdays for people to come to him with their problems and requests. He conferred with members of his cabinet, with military officers, with his private secretaries. He studied maps and books on military tactics, read voluminous reports, and carried on extensive correspondence. If he took time for breakfast or lunch, the meals were light and quick, and frequently taken as he worked. Around 4 p.m., he sometimes took a carriage ride with Mary, usually stopping to visit with sick and wounded soldiers 
in one of the always crowded military hospitals. After dinner, he went back to his office and stayed until 11 p.m. Then he often walked over to the War Department for the latest news. For relaxation, he read humorous satires, the poetry and plays of Shakespeare, and when he could, he attended the theater. For Mary, who as a girl had dreamed of being a president's wife, the years in the White House were not happy ones, and they ended in horror. The wives of most previous presidents had been inconspicuous to the public and participated in formal entertainments as little as they could. But Mary intended to make the White House the center of Washington society, to play the role of first lady, and was the first president's wife to be so known. Naturally, she encountered the hostility of Washington's pro-Southern society matrons, who derided her, as they did her husband, as a barely civilized Westerner, though she was far better educated than most of them. In accordance with her plans, Mary set about redecorating and refurnishing the White House, quickly exceeding the $20,000 Congress traditionally allowed for this purpose. When, apprehensively, she asked her husband to approve the excess bills and send them to Congress, he angrily refused. Before asking for money for flubdubs for that damned old house, he told her, he would pay the bills himself. And he did. Because it was essential for her to dress the part she wished to play, Mary spent large sums on her personal wardrobe although merchants in New York and Philadelphia sometimes lent her gowns to wear. The gowns featured the large hoop skirts favored by stout women, bare shoulders and arms, and low necklines set off by simple but expensive jewelry. Elegance on such a grand scale was new to Washington and drew favorable comment. But there was much criticism, too, from those who believed that under the circumstances, elegance was vulgar. But she was allowed little time to enjoy the celebrity brought by her dinners and balls. On February 20th, 1862, Willie Lincoln, now 11, died of typhoid fever. And life was never again the same for Mary. Lincoln, too, was crushed by the death of his son, generally believed to be the brightest of all the Lincoln boys, and the one most like his father. But he could not give way to his grief as Mary did to hers. Mary spent weeks in bed weeping, and when, later, heavily veiled in black, she attended the New York Avenue Presbyterian Church, she failed to find the solace she craved and turned to spiritualism. In the meantime, she was criticized for just about everything, for extravagance, for spending too much time mourning for Willie, for having so many close relatives fighting for the Confederacy, for the jealousy she often exhibited at receptions and reviews, for women who were spending too much time with her husband. She also seemed jealous of Lincoln's private secretaries, John G. Nicolay and John Hay, who referred to her as the Hellcat. Even as a housewife in Springfield, Mary was known for temper tantrums and had had difficulty in holding on to servant girls. Now the strains of the endless war became too much for her unstable nervous temperament and her behavior was sometimes acutely embarrassing to Lincoln. Yet they also had their times of closeness. In 1868, under false names, Mary, with Tad, sought escape in Europe from the heartbreak and notoriety that beset her in America. When the two returned in 1871, Mary experienced still another affliction, for Tad died, probably of tuberculosis. Lincoln's estate was sufficient to support his wife comfortably, if not luxuriously. Yet periods in which she worried obsessively about money alternated with periods in which she spent it irrationally, and she was known to carry $56,000 in government bonds sewn into her petticoats. In 1875, Robert Lincoln consulted with old and trusted friends, David Davis, the executor of Lincoln's estate, who had presided over the Eighth Judicial Circuit and been appointed by Lincoln to the U.S. Supreme Court, and John T. Stewart, Mary's cousin and Lincoln's first law partner. With their approval, Robert had her tried for insanity and committed to a private sanitarium in Batavia, Illinois. After four months at Batavia, she was released to the custody of Ninian and Elizabeth Edwards in Springfield. At a second trial in 1876, she was found to be sane. 
and after a trip to France, returned to live until her death in 1882 with the Edwardses in the house in which she had been married. She remained in her room day and night with the shades drawn and a money belt around her waist and spent many hours going through her trunks fingering the fine cloth she had smuggled in from her last trip abroad. If Lincoln did not have much of a family life in the White House, he found a degree of compensatory satisfaction in his relations with four members of his official family. Foremost in proximity and intimacy were private secretaries Nicolay in his early 30s and Hay in his middle 20s. Both were like sons to Lincoln. They slept in a room directly opposite from the president's office, though they took their meals mostly at Willard's Hotel, and Nicolay's office connected directly to the president's. The ranking member of the cabinet was Secretary of State William H. Seward, who had had such good reason to believe he would be the Republican nominee for president in 1860. The two men became good friends, often talking over national problems in a most informal manner. Seward was almost assassinated the evening of April 14, 1865, but recovered from his wounds and lived until 1872. The fourth member of his official family with whom Lincoln enjoyed a warm personal relationship was Secretary of War Edwin M. Stanton. The two men took adjoining cottages at the soldier's home outside Washington during the summer and rode back and forth together in deep discussions about the war. Lincoln spent more time with Stanton than with any other official. The two men complimented each other, for Lincoln tended to be soft-hearted and yielding and needed someone hard and inflexible someone who could say no to fall back upon. Upon hearing of Stanton's death in 1869, Mary Lincoln took comfort from her conviction that history would record how nobly the secretary had served his country in its darkest hours. Her husband and Stanton, she told a friend, were very warmly attached to each other, and we can well believe that they are now together. As Frederick Douglass, one of the most influential African-American leaders in our history, used to say, Republicans and Democrats of the Civil War era were divided over slavery, but united in their prejudice against blacks. Pre-war abolitionists, only a small minority of the Northern people, were hated and feared by the majority. But as bloody battle followed bloody battle, more and more whites wanted to destroy the institution they held responsible for the war. Of course, these recruits to abolition, or to use the positive term, emancipation, were anti-Southern, anti-rebellion. There was no fundamental change in their attitude toward the black race. At the same time anti-slavery opinion grew in the North, so, ironically, did pro-slavery opinion. The border slave states were adamantly opposed to emancipation, as were most of the people along the northern shore of the Ohio River. Workers in the expanding industries feared action against slavery would result in the loss of their jobs. If Lincoln adopted a radical policy on slavery, it might so offend these groups that it would become impossible to continue the war. On the other hand, if he failed to do something about slavery, he would lose control of his own party and be unable to lead. Lincoln made the decision to issue a proclamation freeing slaves after talking to McClellan following the general's defeat before Richmond in July 1862 but he decided not to make his decision public until a more positive occasion arose. In the meantime, radicals, not knowing Lincoln had decided to adopt the policy of emancipation, continued to criticize him for his failure to adopt it. At the end of August, 1862, Horace Greeley, editor of the powerful New York Tribune, published an especially critical letter. Instead of assuring Greeley that he agreed with him and was planning to take radical action, Lincoln used the opportunity to educate the public to accept emancipation. Prejudiced moderates and conservatives who would oppose emancipation if presented as an end in itself might be willing to accept it as a means to end the war. My paramount object in this struggle, he said to such people in his reply to Greeley, is to save the Union and is not either to save or to destroy slavery. What I do about slavery, I do because I believe it helps to save the Union. Lincoln concluded this brilliantly conceived letter by stating it gave his view of his official duty 
I intend no modification of my oft-expressed personal wish that all men everywhere could be free. The positive occasion for which Lincoln had waited came in September when McClellan stopped Lee at Antietam. Lincoln announced that on January 1st, 1863, he would declare free all the slaves in those parts of the South still at war with the United States. He believed that as commander-in-chief of the Army and Navy in time of war, he could free slave property as legally as he could confiscate any other property. On New Year's Day, 1863, the Emancipation Proclamation was issued, in its own words, as a fit and necessary war measure for suppressing rebellion. Slavery everywhere in the United States was ended by the 13th Amendment, ratified in December 1865. Controversial as it was, the proclamation lifted the morale of the North, for after emancipation, only the North could convincingly identify its cause with that of humanity. The North's war began as a war for self-preservation and ended as a war for freedom. The South's war began as a war for freedom and ended as a war for self-preservation. The proclamation also put at Lincoln's disposal over 180,000 African-American soldiers, the equivalent of about two armies of the Potomac, without whose help the president said repeatedly he could not subdue the rebellion. Yet when Lincoln changed the object of the war from preserving the Union to preserving the Union by freeing the slaves, he lost the support of many white people in the northern and border states who were willing to fight for their country, but not for the niggers. More than any other single act, the Emancipation Proclamation aroused hatred for Lincoln and opposition to his war. Many other of Lincoln's policies intensified hatred for him. The suspension of the writ of habeas corpus and the arrest and imprisonment of many thousands of civilians, with or without military trials, caused many people to denounce him as a dictator who was destroying cherished constitutional liberties. Anti-Lincoln, anti-war Northerners were called copperheads after the poisonous snake by Republicans. But they saw themselves as the truly loyal Americans who wanted to stop the tyrant Lincoln and his unjust war. After Grant became general in chief in 1864, he assigned Sherman the task of capturing and destroying railroads and centers of communications in the West with the major target being Atlanta, Georgia. He himself set out to destroy Lee's army. In what became a war of attrition, Grant pounded Lee in bloody battles, losing more men in his offensive operations than Lee had available to him for defense. The public denounced him as a butcher. But in spending his resources of manpower so much superior to Lee's, he and Lincoln knew that he would ultimately overwhelm his adversary and win the war unless, as seemed quite possible, the people of the North refused to pay the terrible price of victory. In the West, Sherman made only slow progress in his move against Atlanta from his base in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And in July, a Confederate army nearly captured Washington. With a presidential election coming in the fall, Union prospects were grim. But the fall of Mobile in August and the capture of Atlanta in September brought a change in public opinion, and Lincoln triumphantly defeated his Democratic opponent, General McClellan. If the election was a victory for popular government and the continuation of the war, it was a devastating blow for those Copperheads and Confederates who had so recently believed the North would vote for peace. Since it had not, it was only natural that some of those who most hated Lincoln and who most ardently believed in the Southern cause should have decided the time had come for direct action against the men chiefly responsible for their impending defeat. One such hater of Lincoln and devotee of the Southern cause was the popular young actor John Wilkes Booth. Two days after Lee's surrender at Appomattox, Booth heard Lincoln say in a speech at the White House that he favored giving the vote to literate black men and those who had served in the army. That means nigger citizenship, Booth muttered to a companion. Now, by God, I'll put him through. That is the last speech he will ever make. Throughout the war, Booth had traveled freely in the North, playing in every major city and many minor ones. Everywhere he went, he came into contact with others who felt as strongly as he did about Lincoln's tyranny and unjust war. In October 1864, he conferred with Confederate commissioners in Montreal, Canada, 
whose mission was to stir up Northern resistance to Lincoln. Afterwards, he became active in a plot to capture Lincoln at the soldier's home and rush him by relays of fast horses through Southern Maryland to Virginia, where he would be held hostage for the release of Confederate prisoners of war. He organized a group to help him make careful preparations, but a reasonable opportunity to kidnap the president never arose. Even after the surrender of Lee's army, Booth believed decisive action against the leadership of the United States could save the South. On April 14th, he ordered one member of his group to kill the new vice president, Andrew Johnson, and another to kill Secretary of State Seward. He himself would dispose of Lincoln that night at Ford's Theater. Lincoln was a weary man. Even the constant chorus of congratulations became wearisome. But he was unspeakably grateful that the killing was almost over and that the nation and the principle of democratic government would not perish from the earth. At dinner on April 14th, he spoke of being tired and of looking forward to seeing the comedy, Our American Cousin, playing at Ford's Theater. He was eager to escape the White House and its never-ending visitors and demands. He wanted relaxation. He wanted to laugh. The audience's laughter at a funny line of dialogue was the last sound he ever heard. After firing the shot into the back of Lincoln's head, Booth vaulted from the presidential box to the stage. Before the uncomprehending audience, he held aloft a knife dripping with the blood of Major Henry R. Rathbone, a guest of the Lincolns, and cried, Sic Semper Tyrannus, thus always to tyrants. Then he hurried upstage as fast as the leg he had broken in his jump would allow and exited through the rear door to a waiting horse. Lincoln's inert body was carried from the theater across the street to a tiny back bedroom in a boarding house kept by one William Peterson, where doctors made the dying president as comfortable as possible. Recognizing the wound as mortal, there was nothing else they could do. Secretary of War Stanton, who had rushed to the Peterson house as soon as he heard the news, established a kind of command headquarters in a back parlor close to where Lincoln lay and organized the pursuit of the assassin. All through the night, friends and political allies converged upon the Peterson house and said their silent goodbyes to Lincoln. Mary Lincoln, her dress stained by Major Rathbone's blood, which she believed to be that of her husband, and made delirious by this new and sudden agony, spent the night being cared for by friends in the front parlor. Occasionally, she made her way with assistance to the back bedroom and pleaded with her husband not to die. But he did die at 7.22 Saturday morning, April 15th. And news of his death stunned the nation. The 13-day journey that took Lincoln's body and Willie's back to Springfield contrasted tragically with the journey of 1861. Now there was no cheering, no bands arousing patriotic emotions. Instead, there were black-draped cities and citizens memorial services, hymns, eulogies, and the solemn sound of muffled drums. The slow-moving train stopped at nine cities where Lincoln's casket was removed from its special car and taken through crowds of mourners to a place suitable for public viewing. The first of these cities was Baltimore, where in 1861 it had been too dangerous for Lincoln to show his face. Now, resting on a catafalque surrounded by flowers, thousands of citizens solemnly filed past the open casket and looked through tear-filled eyes at the features of their dead president. If there were still Lincoln haters in Baltimore, New York, and the other cities, and of course there were, they were smart enough to keep quiet, so quiet that Americans soon forgot they had ever existed. The half million city dwellers who stood in line for hours to see Lincoln lying in state for seconds, and another half million Americans in small towns and the open countryside who stood in all weather and at all hours 
patiently waiting to see the funeral train pass slowly by, were united in their sense of loss and love. In essence, if not in intensity, this emotional attachment to Lincoln has been felt by members of every subsequent generation. It has elevated our most controversial president to a level above controversy. On April 26th, after the biggest manhunt in American history, John Wilkes Booth was tracked to a farm in Virginia and shot by a United States soldier as heavily armed he limped his way out of a flaming tobacco shed. He died a few hours later. Among his last words were, tell mother I die for my country. Booth's body was taken back to Washington, positively identified by the initials JWB tattooed on his wrist, by a scar on his neck, by personal belongings found on his body, and later by fillings in his teeth. He was then buried in the earthen floor of the old penitentiary on the grounds of the Washington Arsenal. In July, he was joined by the bodies of four members of his group who had been tried, convicted, and hanged by a military commission. Four other conspirators were sentenced to prison. A large part of the lasting impact of Lincoln's death has been due to its timing, to the brutal suddenness with which it terminated the joyous celebrations taking place all across the northern states. In an instant, jubilation and the yearning for national reconciliation carefully cultivated by Lincoln were transformed into grief and blazing anger against Southerners and Copperheads. The assassination and Lincoln's martyrdom have blinded Americans to the hatred felt for him by so many of his countrymen. Yet recognition that the hatred was very real and very widespread in both sections, and that it was not without rational basis, provides important insights into the terrible nature of the war. Removing the assassination from the context of its times and blaming it on Booth's mean-spirited character or moral depravity helped to make possible the reunion of the North and South, but it has distorted the history of the Civil War. Just as oversimplifying the assassination by blaming it on evil in the assassin misrepresents history, so does the opposite extreme of thinking and speaking of Lincoln as if he were some kind of divinity. Lincoln was no god and would not like being thought of as one. He was instead an extraordinary human being whose unpretentious leadership, gifts of persuasion, and selfless dedication to the democratic ideal enabled him to guide the divided North to victory in the worst kind of war, a war of a nation against itself. He saved the American experiment in popular government and thus gave future generations the chance to spread and deepen democracy and, as he put it, increased the happiness and value of life to all people of all colors everywhere. The last of Lincoln's many funerals, attended by thousands, took place outdoors at Springfield's Oak Ridge Cemetery on May 4, 1865. But Lincoln's body did not rest in peace. In 1876, an attempt was made to steal it and hold it for ransom. While extensive modifications were made in the construction of the tomb, the coffin was secretly moved from place to place within it and around it. Finally, in 1901, with the rebuilding completed, the casket was lifted from an outside vault, opened for the last time, and the well-preserved remains identified. It was then placed within a sunken vault near the coffins of his wife and three deceased sons and covered with two tons of concrete. When Lincoln said farewell to his Springfield neighbors in February of 1861, he told them he faced a greater task in keeping the Union together than Washington had had in establishing it. Passions between the North and South were so inflamed that Lincoln acknowledged he might never return to the place where he had spent most of his adult life. But he did return, mourned and honored as a martyr to the cause for which he had given the last full measure of devotion.